In the last video, we identified chirality with the property of handedness. But what is handedness exactly? What does it mean for an object to be handed? Well, if you refer to the origin of the term, to your hands, the thing you'll notice is that your hands are mere images of each other. In other words, your right hand is the image of your left hand as if it's looking in a mirror. But the two are not perfectly superimposable, and in that sense, they're not identical, since we can't perfectly overlay them. This exactly is the definition of handedness and the definition of chirality. An object is defined as chiral if it's not identical to its mirror image. We're going to formalize this and see it in a molecular environment in this video. Chirality is formally defined as the property of being non-identical to one's mirror image. Essentially, it answers the question, is an object the same as its mirror image or not? This is a yes-no question, and so chirality is a true-false property in the sense that an object either is chiral or is not. And we can define whether an object is chiral or not for any object with spatial extent. Another way to phrase this question, is the molecule identical to its mirror image or not, is to ask the question, does the object look different in a mirror? If so, the object is chiral, and two examples of chiral objects are shown here. If we place a mirror perpendicular to the screen, separating these two groups of objects, what we see is that each object on either side of the mirror is the mirror image of the other. The left hand is the mirror image of the right hand, and vice versa, and the screw with threads running in this direction is the mirror image of the screw on the right with the threads running in the opposite direction. In both of these cases, the objects are non-identical because we cannot perfectly superimpose them. Throughout our discussion of stereochemistry, this is going to be our criterion for two molecules being identical. Our ability to perfectly superimpose them so that all of their atoms and bonds correspond. Of course, there are plenty of objects that are identical to their mirror images, and we call these achiral. Reflection of each of these objects in a mirror generates an image that is identical to the first in the sense that it can be overlaid on the first with absolutely no differences. Foreshadowing an idea that we'll see later, what you can see in blue over each object is a plane of reflection internal to the object that leaves its appearance completely unchanged. For example, if we reflect through this plane that bisects this ladder, the left and right sides change places, but the appearance of the ladder doesn't change at all. Another way to think about this, more consistent with what we did for the chiral objects, is to draw a reflection plane that acts like a mirror and draw the mirror image and see what happens. In the case of the ladder, and more generally in the case of all of these achiral objects, the image that we get is perfectly equivalent to the original. No, I haven't done a good job of drawing that. That's true of an achiral object in general. Achiral objects lack chirality, meaning they are identical to their mirror images. Because chirality is a true-false property, molecules, and more generally all objects, are either chiral or achiral. To really appreciate what chirality means for molecular properties, we have to have a firm understanding of what we mean by the mirror image. The mirror image of a molecule is generated through a very specific topological operation called reflection. This refers to an operation where we start with a plane, project all of the atoms and bonds onto this plane, and then send them through the plane at an equal distance out the other side. Reflection of an achiral object or molecule generates an image indistinguishable from the original. And we can see this in a molecular context using a simple achiral molecule like dichloromethane. Here's a Lewis structure for dichloromethane. And the first step in reflecting this molecule is defining some mirror plane or reflection plane that we're going to use to affect this operation. Let's make the plane vertical, like so. I'm going to go ahead and draw the mirror image, and then we'll see how reflection moves the atoms of the left-hand structure into the reflected atoms and bonds of the right-hand structure. The mirror image looks very similar to the first, but in order to generate mirror images with high fidelity, it is important to appreciate what the operation of reflection is doing to the molecule on the left. Reflection involves taking each atom, projecting it onto the plane, and sending it out the other side of the plane at an equal distance. So the corresponding hydrogen to this one that I'm highlighting in blue in the reflected structure is this one here. What we've done is projected this hydrogen onto the plane and then sent it out the other side at an equal distance. Because this plane is perpendicular to the screen, this reflection doesn't change the height of the hydrogen above the plane of the screen, right, which is implied by the wedge. That's why it remains on a wedge after the reflection. 
reflection of the hydrogen in the back, which I'm highlighting in green, generates this hydrogen in the back in the mirror image. And here, a very similar thing is happening. We're projecting the hydrogen onto the plane and sending it out the plane along that same line at an equal distance. It remains behind the screen the entire time, again, because the plane of reflection is perpendicular to the screen. The same idea applies to the reflected carbon and to each of the reflected chlorine atoms. It's important to understand what reflection is doing in generating a mirror image because for molecules that are chiral, the mirror image is not equivalent to the structure that we started with. One interesting thing about this reflection to generate an equivalent mirror image for achiral objects is, regardless of where we put the reflection plane, the resulting image is equivalent to the original. We may need to do some rotation to show this, but no matter where we put that plane, the resulting image is equivalent to the original, provided the given object or molecule is achiral. One extremely convenient plane for an achiral object is one internal to the object that leaves its appearance completely unchanged. And these are the planes of symmetry that we saw on the last slide, the blue plane shown here for these achiral objects. Notice that reflection of the object through these planes leaves the appearance completely unchanged. It just leaves the object sitting where it is, and it may exchange the left and right halves. That's what's happening, for example, as we reflect through the left and right sides of the ladder left and right sides of the fork, etc. But the appearance of the object after reflection is equivalent to the appearance before reflection. Reflection of a chiral object generates a different object that cannot be superimposed on the original. In the case of dichloromethane, notice that if we left the highlighting in, the reflected structure would not be equivalent to the original. To show that, I'm going to redraw this situation without the atom labels and leave in the highlighting. Reflection of this hypothetical molecule on the left generates the following molecule on the right. And assuming that these four different colors correspond to four different atom types, it's impossible to overlay these structures perfectly. They're non-superimposable and they're non-identical. This exactly is the property of chirality. So what we can say about either molecule separately is that each of these molecules is chiral. Notice that this identification really depended on applying the operation of reflection correctly here. It's not equivalent to a rotation or a flipping of the molecule, it's an actual projection onto a plane and sending the atoms and bonds out the other side to an equal distance.